Hello, everyone, and welcome to On the Safe Side, a monthly podcast hosted by the editors of Safety and Health Magazine, the official magazine of the National Safety Council. This is Kevin Drulli, Associate Editor at Safety and Health. And with me, as always, is fellow Associate Editor, Barry Botino. Hey there, Barry. Hey, Kevin. How are you? All right. How about you? Doing great. Thank you. All right. You bet. And with us in spirit this month is another fellow Associate Editor, Alan Ferguson, who is on assignment. We say welcome and thank you all for joining us for the May 2024 episode of our podcast, number 51 in series history. We hope you enjoyed celebrating a certain round number with us last time out and look forward to offering lots more memories and insightful discussion in the episodes to come. Many of you have had a unique journey into the safety profession, and we want to hear about it for the My Story feature in our magazine. Submit your personal stories about how you got into the safety field by emailing us at safehealth at nsc.org. To view past My Story entries and catch up on all the news from around the safety world, visit our website, safetyandhealthmagazine.com. In this month's podcast, we'll offer a closer look inside the pages of the May edition of Safety and Health Magazine in our In This Issue segment. We'll also be joined by National Safety Council Senior Safety Consultant Richard Flint for our Five Questions With interview. June and National Safety Month are just around the corner, and Richard will be on hand to discuss the four weekly themes of NSM safety engagement, roadway safety, risk reduction, and slips, trips, and falls. And we'll get you caught up on news from around the safety world in our In Case You Missed It segment. Is everybody ready? Here we go. It's a new month, and that means there is a new issue of Safety and Health in your mailbox and online, and that provides us with plenty to talk about. Uh, the May issue features an important story about a persistent issue, falls in the construction industry. The article, written by my colleague Kevin, examines five reasons why construction falls keep happening. In speaking with sources from OSHA, NIOSH, and CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training, Kevin's story discusses issues such as not making time for safety, not wearing PPE, and a lack of pre-work task planning. For anyone in construction or safety pros who are concerned about falls in general, this is a really insightful read. Alan writes about the rapid acceptance of many total worker health concepts and how they've gone mainstream in the past decade plus, according to L. Casey Choswood, who serves as the director of NIOSH's Office of Total Worker Health. While explaining this non-siloed approach to safety, the article discusses what total worker health is, shares tips about making a business case for it, and offers information and tips about resources to get organizations of any size started on their journey. You can find this coverage, as we mentioned, in your mailbox or online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com. Every safety professional has a unique story. So, what's yours? Safety and Health Magazine wants to hear about your path into the occupational health and safety field for our My Story column. You can share your safety origin story by sending a submission to safehealth at nsc.org. As we look ahead to summer, June is an important month in the safety world. The National Safety Council will be providing a month's worth of free safety resources during the annual National Safety Month observance. Since 1996, NSC has offered numerous resources to highlight the leading causes of preventable injury and death. With us this month on the podcast to discuss National Safety Month and the four weekly themes of the 2024 event is our NSC colleague, Richard Flint. Richard is a senior consultant in NSC's consulting group. Richard began his career as an electrician, then he became an automation engineer before moving into the safety field, where he's been for more than two decades. Richard, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast this month. Well, happy to be here. Thank you, guys. Well, Richard, where we wanted to start with you was how can safety professionals and employers use National Safety Month as a time to refocus on safety goals? Well, one thing I think would be uh, would be handy is to take a look at your programs and decide where your weak points are and try to determine if you need any help in achieving those goals. Uh, one of the ways that uh, we can help at the NSC is through consulting. We have a, a new consulting arm of the NSC right now, of which I'm a part of, and we do a lot of consulting with, uh, with companies to help them refocus uh, on their safety goals. 
Well, Richard, the focus of week one, which is set for June 1st through 8, is safety engagement. What are some ways to engage workers more often? Well, I would say there's three main ways, conversations, uh, conversations, and conversations. Uh, I think communication is everything in engaging employees. Uh, You can have all the programs and policies you want, but there is no substitute for going out and engaging the people out there that work for you and their ideas of how they can be safer because they really are the ones that know more than almost anybody about what they can do to be safer. So I would say conversations, uh, if you're not good at them and you're a safety professional, you need to get good at them because it is the number one tool in your toolbox for keeping people safe. Well, Richard, week two, the theme is uh, roadway safety, and that is going to be June 9th through the 15th. Can you tell us a little bit about how roadway safety efforts and knowledge can impact a workforce? Sure. It can uh, not only impact the workforce, but impact us all. Um, I've been with NSC now about 10 months, and I uh, have stepped up my traveling quite a bit. And knowing what a pain in the neck it is to fly around the country these days, I will drive whenever given the uh, the opportunity, if it's close enough. You know, it used to be I would drive my car if I was within two or three hours, and that has stretched now into about six or eight hours. So I would much prefer to drive than fly. So, uh, but I have learned how to make these drives safely, and I think a large part of it is planning. Uh, I think not only uh, planning your route, I'm not talking about that, but I mean thinking through the whole trip. Uh, If it's going to be longer than a certain number of hours, I want to make sure that I arrive during daylight hours. So at the tail end of my drive, as I get more and more tired, I'm not battling darkness as well. I think about the rush hours, if I have to drive through any metropolitan areas, avoiding those. So there's a lot of... uh, a lot of risk that can be reduced to driving simply by pre-planning your trips and thinking through the whole journey. Week three of National Safety Month is June 16th to 22nd, and its theme is risk reduction, which is every safety pro's goal. In what ways can this be achieved? Well, I'm glad you asked. Risk reduction is a subject very close to my heart, and it's something that I teach a lot as I go around the country and present. Um, What I find is that safety pros, like most of your listeners, I'm sure, understand pretty much what what, uh, risk is, the way to define it. And that is basically probability of an accident happening multiplied by the severity of the potential injury. That's a pretty simple definition of risk, but uh, not very well understood by frontline supervisors and workers. And I think that it should be taught to everybody, not just safety people. Because only by understanding that probability times severity math do you truly appreciate and are able to properly identify what true risk is so that you can avoid it. Um, We've all seen squirrels on the side of the road that tend to run out and then run back and then run out, sometimes changing direction right underneath your car. We've all seen that. Uh, This idea of these squirrels doing this, uh, it's like they have two meters in their head, one that is measuring uh, risk and the other one is measuring reward. Uh, But they have no idea how to properly gauge these things. So their meters are constantly jumping around. And because of that, they're actually jump around. Well, we're all a little bit like those squirrels, and uh, we all gauge risk and reward throughout the day. Everything we say, everything we do, almost always we're comparing those two things and acting accordingly. But too often, risk gets completely misread because we don't really understand the probability times severity math. We don't truly appreciate the probability of something going wrong, and we don't truly appreciate the severity of the injury if it did go wrong. And if we pause and take a few minutes to think about those things before we do anything risky, whether you be on a construction site or getting in your car, then I think it would go a long way to uh, to helping people be- make better decisions and make better risk decisions specifically. Well, Richard, week four, the final week of National Safety Month, is June 23rd through 30th, and it focuses on a a common yet persistent issue, slips, trips, and falls. How can workplaces be safer from this persistent hazard? 
Well, that's a good question. Uh, I have found that what causes most slips and trips around workplaces, especially slips, let's talk about that first, is it's not necessarily a lack of traction that gets you. It's the lack of expected traction that gets you. So if you're walking around on a carpet and all of a sudden you step off a carpet onto a linoleum floor and it's wet, that that sudden change in traction, if you don't see it coming, that's what gets you because you uh, you basically adjust your stride, your stride and your footing to accommodate uh, the traction that you're used to. Now, in the case of an industrial area, if you're walking around and you have great traction and then all of a sudden you step in an area where something has been spilled, your traction suddenly changes and it's that sudden change that gets you. So the only way I know to protect yourself from that, especially in industrial areas, is to kind of twist your feet as you walk around every now and then and check your traction. Uh, I'm from Rochester, New York. We have a lot of snow and ice. We have a lot of uh, slip, trip and falls uh, in and out of the buildings that we work in because of that snow and ice. So it's very important and we tend to learn at an early age how to walk like penguins and how to twist our ankles to check for our attraction uh, as we go through the day. Uh, the other problem as far as trips and falls are uh, probably the biggest problem that's come up in the last decade have been these smartphones we're all carrying around. Uh, people talk about how dangerous they are to drive with a smartphone. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I got in the car and did the smart thing. I took my phone, I put it in the glove box because I would never answer my phone or do a text while I'm driving. But as, as soon as I got to the grocery store, I reached over, pulled my phone out of the uh, glove box, got out of the car, looked down to see if I had gotten any uh, communication while I was driving and walked right into a shopping cart. So I made the drive part really safe, but as soon as I got out of the car and started walking, it got me. So uh, distracted walking is a real thing. It happens all the time. Well, for our listeners, uh, please feel free to check out NSC's free National Safety Month resources at nsc.org slash nsm. And once again, that website is nsc.org slash nsm. Richard, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us on the safe side this month. Well, thank you. It was fun. We talked in the intro about June being around the corner, which means that this is May, the gateway to summer. Outdoor activities and yard work are ramping up again, and these all are understandable reasons why you might not be hunkering down to read about the occupational safety and health sphere. Why stay inside if you don't have to, right? That's why we're here with In Case You Missed It, a segment that aims to shine a light on news that might have slipped through the cracks, whether a rototiller was involved or not. To get things started, I wanted to mention something about an OSHA alert on fall protection lanyards and uh, just a little bit of additional context and, and some overlap between the construction falls feature that Barry discussed in the in this issue segment. Um, a lot of the the agencies um, that that we we spoke with um, have been working on on resources to that end, and um, OSHA had had issued a hazard alert kind of right around the time between uh, the writing and reviewing process and and this being published. But it was it was prompted by the death of a worker whose fall protection lanyard was severed by an exposed edge as he fell. So with that, OSHA had issued a hazard alert in, in re recent weeks. Um, certainly leading and exposed edges are, are nothing new to this industry, but it's something where experts have said that resources are something that these agencies are cognizant of that need to kind of be brought up to speed. So in, in so doing, OSHA just really reminds workers that these exposed edges can include floors, roofs, decks, platforms, or, or formwork. Um, and in, in the case of, of this um, incident for which the alert was prompted, the, the lanyard actually was not approved for working on or around sharp edges. And that's a discussion and something that the industry is cognizant of too. And there, we explore a little bit more in the, in the feature, but just some, some points of emphasis that, that OSHA makes and really is asking employers first to inspect fall protection equipment before it's used and to cover exposed edges that could come in contact with a lifeline or a lanyard. And that's, quote, regardless of the edge's composition, unquote. Um, employers also should make sure that the covering or protective material won't move when a lifeline or lanyard slides across it and also should limit fall distance or use another control method to avoid lanyard or lifeline contact with the edge if a covering is not feasible. Barry, how about you? Well, Kevin, you had mentioned that we're kind of closing in on summer here and 
this is the time of year when outdoor work gets a little more challenging. Um, and with that in mind, on March 26, the Phoenix City Council unanimously passed an ordinance that requires contractors and subcontractors who work with the city to have a written safety plan that addresses severe heat. Um, and it's especially important uh, for folks in Phoenix because last summer they had 31 consecutive days with temperatures above 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and now what this ordinance calls for is that this heat mitigation safety plan that will be required. Um, it includes um, giving workers easy access to rest, shade, and drinking water, uh, training on recognizing and preventing heat-related injuries and illnesses, and also uh, by May 1st, 2025, it will require uh, workers to have access to air conditioning in vehicles that have enclosed cabs. So a really important development uh, from the folks in Phoenix. Absolutely. No, it's, I know we've discussed before just certainly the, the breadth of heat coverage and ordinances that we follow. So that definitely is, is something very important. So yes, as Barry said, stay, stay tuned for more. Well, now it's the turn of you, the listener. Is there something important that you've learned recently and want others in the safety world to know? Please email your thoughts and feedback to us at safehealth at nsc.org. We're eager to hear from you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this month's episode of the podcast. We know your time is valuable, and we appreciate you spending some of it with us. We encourage you to visit safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash podcasts to check out any of our past episodes. That includes episode 29. During that episode, we discuss SIF prevention, and we interviewed hazard communications expert Chandra Joyello, who had some really interesting things to say about Hascom. We'd also appreciate you rating, reviewing, or spreading the word about this podcast. To find stories, news, and insights from around the safety world, you can check us out online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com. And make sure you follow us on your favorite social media channel. The original music for this podcast was composed by Steve Maslin. Thank you so much, Steve. And a big thank you to all of our NSC colleagues behind the scenes who make this podcast go, including our boss, Melissa Ruminski, who has now gifted us an on-air light-up sign for our recording sessions here in the NSC studio. So thank you, Melissa. We'll be back next month to have more safety-related discussions, talk to trusted voices from around the profession, and hopefully make you smile a little. In the meantime, please... Stay on the safe side.